We are thrilled to have you on the show. Uh, <laughs> well, you don't know yet, you know. I might turn out to be a real dud. <laughs> no, 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 no. Trust me, you're not. Oh. Uh, take. Let's go back to near the beginning and, and kind of uh, what do you think it was that drew you to acting? What was it? Go back to the beginning of my life. You mean? <laughs> well, when you when you first knew you wanted to be an actor, what was it in you well, that acting fulfilled? Well, look, but we can really start because it did start really way way early in my life, probably when I started school, because um, you know kindergarten and things like that, back home in East Chicago, Indiana, and uh, eighty two years ago, we might as well get all that out of the way, and um, they always in school somehow were pushing me up into little little projects as I went along. I'm not, in fact, I remember the first thing I ever did I, that I remember doing in grade school was, um, and I think it, m- it might have been the first grade or second grade, that um, I, I played a blackbird. And <laughs> I know that oh. sounds weird, but I remember it because my mother had, had to make the little, um, the little crepe paper, um, hood and everything that had to go over my head and uh, with a beak and my face stuck out with a you know the yellow beak and I remember because I helped her I helped her roll the crepe paper over a pencil and then you shove it together and it gets all sh- crinkled up and all and I remember one evening we just sat and did that for ever and ever it seemed I can't remember quite whether it looked like feathers or what but that was my first my first stage appearance was a blackbird. I think it was nine and twenty blackbirds baked in the pie, and you know that little nursery rhyme thing. I think right, okay. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, that was numero uno, <laughs> and then from then on, uh, they were always putting me on. Well, I won't say the stage, but the little plays and things like that that were uh, held in school, and I, I, evidently I was quite comfortable showing off i suppose <laughs> but i i really was i never thought about being frightened or anything like that i i liked it i liked it a yeah. lot okay. and so um that was the beginning that it all was in my blood from very very early on and uh oh i when i finished high school i went to my mother's business college in east chicago it was a uh, ECBC, which was uh, the college that she owned and ran. And she said, you know, I always want you to have something to fall back on to earn a living, so you have to come to school. Well, I was the worst, you know. I wrote beautiful shorthand. Greg, I think it was, that I, I know that that's what it was. The whole thing was that everybody else could read it, but I couldn't. I would yeah. remember what it was I wrote when I worked at WGN while I was at school at DePaul University studying drama there. And I remember the sports announcer, Jack Brickhouse, he had me come in one day because his gal, secretary or whatever, was sick or something, and I had to take down all this dictation. And as I say, I wrote it beautifully. I just couldn't read it, that's all. It was mm-hmm. Greek to me. But uh, I, so I went to Mama's, and then after about a few months, I got a job at the B&O Railroad in the Baltimore and Ohio uh, and worked uh, for the car foreman on the rip track. And um, didn't really think about, you know, going to be doing any acting. Never really came to my mind at all. And uh, and other than what I had done in high school. And so I remember that... Um, well, my parents, after I'd been working about a year, I think it was, for the B&O, uh, said to me, you know, don't you think it's time you further your education? And I said, well, I really don't know what I want to do. So my mother, a very pragmatic lady, said, well, go into the city, into the loop in Chicago, and uh, take an aptitude test. So I went to the YWCA. They gave one for nothing. And I took the test, and a couple of weeks I went back to get the reading, so to speak, and it showed that uh, I had a flair for the arts, which, uh, you know, drawing and things like that, and I don't know how they judge those darn things, 
and <laughs> and that I was uh, I had a flair for the arts, and that uh, uh, what I and and people I should be involved in personnel work because I had a big affinity affinity for people, which I always have had. I've always loved like people. I don't want to be with all of them, you know, but I, 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 but I like them. <laughs> I like yeah. the whole idea. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I said coming home on the train, and the last thing I was supposed to be doing was uh, pounding a typewriter in an office. At least yeah. that's what the test showed. Anyway, I'm coming home on the train after getting the reading, and I thought to myself, well, you know, which of the arts would I meet the most people and be involved with the most people? And I I thought, well, you know, maybe maybe acting. Mm-hmm. So a few weeks later, my dad brought a, a guy home from work who had been, he and his wife had gone to New York to become actors. They had gone to the Goodman Theater in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And he was there for dinner. And, of course, you know, they always ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up or whatever? Who knows? And I... Um, I just said that I had taken that aptitude test, and he said, "Well, there's one the one man in Chicago that we'd recommend, you know, that you work with, and go to the Goodman Theater and work with David Itkin, Doctor Itkin, who was a uh, a Russian man and who had been an actor and mm. with the Moscow Art Theater and all of that. And uh, so I." I said I couldn't go when I found out how expensive the Goodman Theater was. I, I just didn't have the money. I was going to be putting myself through school, and uh, I was going to have to work. And that was school was during the daytime. But Dr. Itkin taught at DePaul, P-A-U-L, uh, University in Chicago at night from 6 o'clock to midnight. So I went to DePaul, and I worked during the daytime and pounding typewriters here and there and worked for WGN, the mutual broadcasting system back then. And I sold shoes at Marshall Fields and worked in the office in the in the school building with the, um, in those days it was the 40s, and all these young men had came back from being in uh, the service and were going to school. And, of course, everybody wants to be an actor, you know. Right, right. So, But I worked in the vet's office, I remember, at school. And that was my beginning. Hmm. Then... Well, well, you said that... Let me let me ask you about uh, your, your teacher that you just mentioned. Dr. Itkin? Itkin, yes, ma'am. Itkin, I-T-K-I-N. Mm-hmm. You said that he was Russian. I would imagine yes. that he, he probably taught Stanislavski. No, he didn't teach Stanislavski. He went to the Moscow Art Theater, which was, he worked with Stanislavski, yes. Oh, okay. oh see, you want to be an actor, too. Well, Not too I many know people actors. know that. <laughs> <laughs> the book, of course, is in Actor Prepares. That yes, was ma'am, I've, I've read all three. All three uh, oh, oh, all three of them. Did you ever read Boyeslavsky, too? No, ma'am. B-O-Y-E-S-L-A-V-S-K-Y, yeah. That was well. That was the same genre, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, okay. Well, then tell me about your acting career. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm wondering, are those kind of the techniques? I mean, do you consider yourself? Oh a, yes. a method actor. Ab- absolutely. Well, yeah. the method, you know, that that came along, which uh, at the um, at a neighborhood, not the neighborhood playhouse. That was uh, Sandy Meisner. Or... Mm-hmm. But the other one, yeah, down, down, which I uh, auditioned for them and got in and all of that. But it um, by then I was working, and here in 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 New York. But I do that is my method, you know that that I prepare, uh, an actor prepares. But you know I always make a, um, a biography or an autobiography, I should say of the character of the role that I'm going to be playing because mm-hmm. I remember David always said, Dr. Itkin, uh, you know, that you always have a life before you go on stage or before you go in front of a camera or whatever, but before you play, you know, what it is you're going to do. And and uh, I always, always, no matter what I have done, I have always prepared a character, including Mrs. Voorhees. Course. You know, yeah, for course, yeah, uh, yeah I, I made a whole story up about her. And I think that's the reason why uh, the people who like Mrs. Voorhees, um, I suppose there's some who don't, but I haven't met them yet. They all seem <laughs> to enjoy her very much. 
But uh, <clears throat> I my do you want to know the story that I Absol- just said? Absolutely, of please. Yeah. Okay. Well, I decided that um, she. Uh, I was reading the script, and my my agent had sent me the script for Friday the Thirteenth. And at the time, I was on Broadway doing. I think I was doing same time next year. I'm not sure. I did that for a year and a half, and uh, on Broadway, or the last year that it was on Broadway, and um, I. Uh, Let's see where have I gone? I keep jumping around here. I uh, I no 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 no. It's okay. It's just me keeping things straight in my head, which sometimes they get pretty crooked. <laughs> They're a little bit funny. Um, I decided that as I was reading the script, I came upon one part in the script. In it, uh, in, in a screenplay, of course, you have uh, instructions about what all the pictures are that they make in it. The mm-hmm. scenes and all, and there was this one shot of a hand with a um, a man's class ring on it, and I said, "Oh, oh!" I said, "Oh, well, okay. She's from the same time in school that I'm I'm a, was a part of, and uh, because we all went steady in high school, or most of us." And the girls wore the boys' class ring, you know, and around your neck on a string, or you did the taping thing on your hand because they were always bigger. And so I thought from that moment on, I thought, okay, she's where I was and when I was and the same age. So that made me comfortable with the character. And my story that I thought was, well, here she was going steady. And in those days, you know, you didn't go to bed with anybody. Well, we had one girl in our class who did, but that was it. <laughs> There's yeah. always that one girl. There's always that one girl, yeah. There's always that one <laughs> All the rest of us, you know, go, mm, my, 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 my. And the secretly in our heart, we just couldn't imagine how she could probably do things like that. But anyway, yeah, or some, I think, maybe one or two. Whoops. Have I cut us off? No. No, no, no. Okay. All right. So I said, okay. That she, you know, and she was going steady, wearing the ring and all, but they did go to bed, and they did make love, and she became pregnant. So she said to him in school, you know, she said, oh, my gosh, I'm pregnant. And he said, oh, you know, don't brush them off on me. Oh, no, I'm not going to be responsible. So she, she was rejected by him. Well, of course, she couldn't tell anybody at home. And um, when she, the pregnancy continued all of a sudden you know she was beginning to show the pregnancy and her father had realized she had to admit what happened her father threw her out of the house he said be gone you're a tramp don't you're not any daughter of mine i don't ever want to see you again and you know shoves her out into the world well here she was she didn't know how to earn a living or anything like that and uh she went to the salvation army because I used to do work for the Salvation Army and publicity and things for them. It came about through Gary Moore and the I've Got a Secret show. And I knew that they had a home for unwed mothers, so I said with her, and then she went there to have the baby. So, poor thing, you know, trying to care for this baby and this little boy that was growing up and one with any kind of job that she could get to do, because she wasn't educated. And this... Uh, she saw the article that they needed a cook at this camp for boys and girls and, and this one summer. And she thought, well, I can, you know, work in the kitchen and cook and do dishes and my little boy can be with other children. And so she does. She gets the job. And he's maybe about six or seven years old then. And and um, they go to the camp. And, you know, oh, Kevin, what's his name? <laughs> goes off to make love with a girl in the picture, of course, you know, and uh, leaves the children and the, my little boy drowns. So I try to close that camp down every year after that. I didn't want it to happen to another child. And I think that the script said something about that there was a fire one year and then there was, a, I don't know, something else another year, that these were all things that she did. And, of course, there she is back again when we come upon her in Friday the 13th. And then, and uh, you know the story from there on in. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So that's how you know, I justified her. She wasn't a bad person at all. 
Right. She just was trying to save other children. Right. And it's important to do that, isn't it? I mean, if you're playing someone that, you know, the general audience would look at and believe is insane. Mm -hmm. uh, Right. You You know, this is a nice lady, a nice lady lady who's trying to um, uh, To do the right thing. Well, to save lives. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she comes in and she's helping the girl and the girl's frightened and all of that. And, of course, I had never met anybody else, (coughs) excuse me, in the picture. Because I shot about the last, it was about the last 10 days. Right. And how they, when they offered me the picture, when that came about, I, I heard that Estelle, they had offered it to Estelle Parsons first, who's really a wonderful mm. actress, and yeah. uh, a bigger gal than I am, uh, or was, and am still. And, yeah. uh, you know, that, uh, but I, I run into her every now and then. And I've known her for years, but I've never asked her whether she did turn the role down. And mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure. I will one day when I see her someday. I'll just say, listen, did this ever happen? But they right. told me they wanted her. And um, that's because, and then also they, you know, made me wear a lot of sweaters and stuff to make me look bigger, like I could was capable of throwing somebody through a window in the kitchen and all, mm-hmm. all the things I did. Mm-hmm. But I remember that I just... Uh, She's just a lady who is trying to help this poor girl who's terribly upset. Right, right, <laughs> And right. look what happens. <laughs> what, was, what was the atmosphere on the set like when you arrived? You said that you arrived at the tail end and you kind of avoided the Well, the there wasn't prior. really a set. There wasn't really a set. We shot this at a Boy Scout camp mm-hmm. called Camp Nobi Bosco, I think North Bergen County Boy Scout Camp. It was over in New Jersey. And um, so we used um, the lake that it was on. In fact, the day that I drove up, uh, there was a sign outside where I was to turn in and go back into the woods, and it said Crystal Lake. And I thought to myself, hmm, this might be a good omen, because as a kid, from the time I was about two till I was about ten, every summer I spent at a lake called Crystal Lake Mm -hmm. in Warsaw, Indiana. So I thought, oh, that's interesting, Crystal Lake. Hmm. And I never thought anything more about it. And I really, when um, I was driving home from the theater this one night, this is before the the script ever came into my hands, and um, my car broke down on the Connecticut Turnpike, just stopped. And um, I couldn't get it started, and then... So I was sitting in it, wait, waiting for the police to come along, hoping they, they would. They never come around when you need them, you know. But so I was sitting there maybe like a half an hour, and a car stopped behind me, and a man got out, and he said, what's the problem? And I said, I, I can't get my car to start. I said, I'm just hoping that the police will come and help me. And he tried to start it, and he couldn't either. So he said, well, I'll take you to a telephone. They had telephones uh, out uh, on the blocks of streets, you know, it'd just be a telephone mm-hmm. outside. And um, I didn't quite remember where, or didn't know where I was, whether I was in Connecticut, where I was living and driving home to, or whether I was still in New York. But anyway, he dropped me off, and I called the AAA and told them my predicament, and I said, I'm not quite sure where I am, but I thought I was near Greenwich, Connecticut, and so... And the man drove off. He left me, you know, and so I walked back to the car, which was about probably about a quarter of a mile. Got back to the car again, still no police. Got into the car, and another car drove up behind me, and it was another man, and he said, what's the problem? I said, my car won't start, but I said, I've called AAA, and they're coming, so he drove away. Finally, this young guy came in. Oh, he was so upset that he had to be out at that hour of the night. By this time, it's like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And um, he couldn't do anything with it, so he was going to leave me. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, will you take me at least to a train station so I can go home? So it took me five and a half hours to get a trip that usually took about an hour and 15 minutes. And I said to myself, Betsy, you need a new car. You can't have this happening to you. So that was on a Tuesday night, and on 
Wednesday I talked with my daughter and she said, oh, she said, you should go and look at a Scirocco, a Volkswagen Scirocco. She said, it's such a cute car. So I did. I went to the place and it was wonderful. It was just a cute little car with a little hind end up in the air. And um, the price of the car was, now we're talking 30 years ago, but it was uh, $9,999.50, something like that. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I thought to myself, oh, great, you know, and how am I going to come up with this money? But I didn't think anything more of it until Friday my agent called and said, how would you like to do a movie? I said, great. I said, out in California? He said, no, no, it's a feature film, but and it's 10 days' work, and it's going to be shot over in New Jersey. And he said, uh, and it, they'll pay you um, $1,000 a day. I said, great, it'll pay for the car I need to buy. You know, I said, right. perfect, you know. So he said, well, he said, there's no, wait a minute. He said, Is there, there's just one drawback about it. And I said, what's that? He said, it's a horror film. I said, what? I said, horror film. I said, oh, my gosh, no, 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 no. I said, it's bad enough that I play a game on television. Like, I've got a secret, and I'm known as a game player. Mm-hmm. I said, uh, and then to add a, a horror film to being a game player when I really wanted to be respected as a very sincere actress, which, of course, I always was. But, mm-hmm. you know, people make opinions about things or have opinions. Anyway, I thought about the money and I thought about the car. And I said, oh, I read this. I said, send me the script. He sent me this. <laughs> Excuse me. I read it and I said, what a piece of. Crap. You can, you can I really say said that. S-H-I-T. Okay. I said, you know, the bad words that you can't say. So you really maybe. thought that, then? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh okay. yeah. I always thought that was, a, you know, just hearsay rumor or gossip. But, okay, no, okay. That's a, okay that's no, great. no. I mean, that was a legitimate actress. I was no, no, very... of course. You were, you were no, no, two, I know what you mean. Two great movies I love growing up. So um, <laughs> you're in two movies I really love a lot. So um, Which two? The Last Angry Man and Mr. Roberts. Oh, The Last Angry Man was my last film with that's Mr. One, Muni. I love that. Paul, what was it like to work with Paul Muni? I know that's totally awesome. I had done a play with him a, a couple of years before we did the movie, and uh, he wanted to come back to Broadway. And um, so we were rehearsing this play. God, I can't remember what the name of it was now. And uh, anyway, um, I can't remember. Anyway, we rehearsed and went out of town to try it out, mm-hmm. and up in Syracuse, New York, at a theater up there, and we folded up there. It never came to Broadway, oh. and so a lovely man. Oh, what a sweet man he, he was. was. One of, he's definitely I loved one working favorite. with him. What, dear? He's one of my favorites, and my dad loved Paul Muni. He loved him in Scarface oh, yes. and uh, Juarez. And I'm Very a respected actor, yeah. mm-hmm. tremendously so. Yeah, I've worked with some pretty... Respectful really people have. in the you business. Really have. I mean, yeah, and all never. I never really planned it. It all just sort of fell into place mm-hmm. like that. You know, Henry yeah. Fonda and Jack Lemmon and all. When I look people. at these, when I look at these people, like the, like the people that <coughs> you've worked me. with that you've mentioned, and Joan Crawford, who was a uh-huh. close friend, I know. Uh, yeah. When you look at the Hollywood, when you look at the Hollywood of today, you know, you, you look yesteryear, and there were such big personalities. Do you find they definitely were today? very different. Well, I, I really don't go to movies. First of all, I never go and see myself. Right. And I've only seen Friday the 13th now four times in the 30 years. And I got forced into it the, the, the three times. <laughs> so, you know, on different occasions when I was going to be interviewed or talk after they showed the film or something. But I never really could stand to watch myself doing anything. Mm-hmm. And, um, but... I had the opportunity to work with a lot of interesting people, but I didn't care for the art form of film as an actress. I just, um, it, it just, like they used to say, it was like the army, hurry up and wait. Right. You know, mm-hmm. you just, and not a continuation and a flow of things. I mean, when I work, I want to get on the stage and go for two hours or three hours or whatever, you know. This breaking Absolutely. everything up I found very difficult for mm-hmm. me. And so I, <coughs> excuse me, I've had some bronchitis here. Um, 
the um, I, I found it that it, it it wasn't as satisfying to me. Just amazing, amazing. I had to work with John Ford, you know, on my first two films. Uh, I mean, just a fabulous director, big, big director. Yeah. Larger than life yeah. figure, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you've done all this amazing work, work with all these amazing people, and this is what I'm wondering. The, the success of Friday the 13th, the fact that it's such a phenomenon, has that ever felt like a thorn in your side? No, it, 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 well... I, I, I didn't respect it. Maybe I can put it that way. I figure, okay, I did this, you know, crappy thing, and mm-hmm. uh, it's not going to be around or anything like that. So I ignored it. And to have it, you know, continue to have the appeal that it did, and that it's <laughs> 30 years and the people are still loving it. Right. You know, I just, and I kind of dismissed it as far as my career and all was concerned. I mean, I didn't. I don't think I even ever put it down as credits or anything. You know, I just thought, oh, you know, oh yeah, that, that. And what I mean, I'm in it. What? Ten minutes, fifteen minutes. I never really had large roles in any of the movies I did, but I did some good movies that are still around. Yeah. yeah. You know, with some very, very big movie actors, but uh, I just uh, and then really in the last. I finally came to peace about it inside of myself, but maybe only like about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I never, I really never thought of it. And then, when I've had to look at it as often as I've had to look at it, when I stopped being so judgmental about myself, I'm one of those actors that really are just terribly, terribly hard on themselves and don't want to see. There are a lot of actors who don't want to see themselves. We just become so hypercritical, you know, it's just right. pathetic. And But once I started, let, when I got let my ego get out of the way and really looked at the film, I began to see, well, this is an interesting film. You know, the film itself, you never see. Your imagination is what uh, uh, Sean Cunningham, I don't know whether Sean did it on purpose or whether uh, uh, it sort of happened that way, but... It's brilliant that you never see you. You only have the feeling that it is a man. Oh, I mean, you did in the beginning days. Not anymore. Everybody knows that it's me, and they know when I walk on the scene, I'm going to be the killer. But, right. uh, but other than that, you always just see uh, the actually our Tommy. Um, uh, what's his name? Our Tom Savini. Tommy Savini. Yeah, he his assistant actually was the one who did all of me. Until I came upon the scene for the last days, ten days of yeah. shooting. Mm. So it was a guy, you know. You see a hairy hand, and I don't have hair on the back of my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we spoke with Adrian. We spoke with Adrian. Adrian King. King. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she, she was discussed. such a little girl. She was so young. <laughs> she was like a teenager in those days. She talked about how absolutely committed you were, uh, particularly with those. For those fight scenes. Uh, and, and well, I mean, out. there's that, 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 it's just that one incident that people pick up on it. And I guess it's, um, Adrian has st- spoken of it, that we were going to rehearse a slap that I was supposed to do to her uh, mm-hmm. in the film. And um, I just, uh, <laughs> she said I was so committed. They should have committed me, they maybe. <laughs> but I mean, on the stage, you, you do it for real. Except that you know how to like how to slap somebody uh, because it's, there's a t- technique to it so that you don't hurt the other person. So we were in in this you know, cabin or with a bunch of straw bales of straw and stuff. I remembered, and we were ca- getting ready to shoot the one where I'm supposed to hit her. You know, it's inside the the cabin and it's where the pantry scene happens and all of that. Mm-hmm. And um, so I said, well, what, let's rehearse this, you know, so that we get this connected. And, and I said, I won't hurt you, I promise. I said, I know how to do it and to catch you right on your jaw. But so you be, I don't break your jaw and I don't you know, do anything. So she said, fine. And uh, so we, you know, stand up and off in the corner and I haul off and hit her. 
well, she drops to the floor in a heap, crying, Sean! Sean coming in, Sean, she hurt me! You know, I thought, oh, God, I said, I didn't hurt you, did I? I think so, I don't know. So I hadn't heard her, but it really surprised the heck out of her. And he said, no, 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 Betsy, in films we don't hit people. I said, well, why not? Why not? I said, for God's sake. The hell not? <laughs> right, exactly, God almighty. You know, I said, well, it's, it, he said, no, you miss her. I said, well, it's going to look like I've missed her. <laughs> He said, no, no, no. He said, we'll shoot it in such a way and, and make a sound effect. So yeah. I always did say that it still looks like I missed her. But maybe <laughs> not. I don't know. <laughs> but there was that sequence, and I think I think she, Adrian always talks about that. In terms of performance, and, and you, you you have to take into account the spirit of the, the writing and the spirit of the movie, but when you're playing this at, such a fever pitch are are there concerns about going over the top or is that the whole point of it oh no the whole point is not to go over the top anytime in your acting <laughs> right no i must say that you first of all when you're going to play a heavy right mm -hmm. when you're going to play the bad person you tend to kind of like want to uh, now i'll just like put my 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 arm up over my my face, you know, and go, ha, 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 ha. you know, how you, because, well, well, it's like, um, what's his name, Jack, and, uh, oh, God, that wonderful actor. Jack Nicholson. But Nicholson, you know, in the chase through all the, the snow hedges right. in the maze and everything, yeah, and shining, that wonderful yeah. movie. Yeah, The Shining, right. And he, when you see him with his eyes rolling in that yeah. laugh, you know, and uh, so... I, and I, that movie had already been, I'd seen that movie, I think. But I, you tend to want to do that because you, it gets sort of like you, 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 you get campy about it, you know. Mm. You go That's a little too far. Mm. It goes over the edge. And, but Sean wouldn't let me do it. He would just say, no, no, no. First of all, with film, you're supposed to make everything not as big and bold and mm -hmm. overboard right. because the camera is right there and so close. So I I didn't believe him, but he was right, and uh, I didn't. I kept thinking, you know, it's going to look like I'm not a mad woman at all. But uh, that's what makes it work well, too. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. And 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 such a big, uh, such a different kind of fan base that I'm sure <clears throat> at the beginning of your career you thought you'd end up with. <laughs> uh, right. But, uh, Never dreamed. They? Yeah, how how are those fans? What what's your Oh, reaction? they're adorable. They're absolutely so divine. When I do the autograph signing conventions and all of them, of course they all come, you know, yeah. to uh well, it's usually those horror conventions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've never seen any of the other movies. I don't know who the other actors are. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're right. fun and they're sweet, you know, but I've never seen the films. Mm -hmm. And uh but it's no, they come and they like to have their picture taken with me and Sometimes they bring a little baby with them, and they have me put they hold the baby in my arms, and and I have a sweater that I it, that's very close to it. In fact, everybody thinks it is the sweater that was in the film, and it's not. But it's you know it's white and off white, and it's that cable stitch, that Irish sort of looking wonderful sweater thing. And I found it somewhere at some point in time. Didn't think anything about it, and I, I took it to one autograph signing things because I always have three days of work and you change clothes each day. Except I don't anymore. I stay in the same outfit now because that's what they want. Is it's Mrs. Vorey's sweater, yeah. and they think you know. So uh, I wore it one day, and then the next day I didn't. And a woman in the elevator said to me, she said, "Where's your sweater?" I said, what do you mean? She said, the sweater, Mrs. Vorey's sweater. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, the sweater you wore yesterday. I said, oh, well, I don't know. It's upstairs. I'm just wearing something else. No, you've got to wear that sweater, she said. So I realized that they thought it was Mrs. Vorey's sweater. It makes wow. me look like the character. So for all three days, I wear the same damn thing. <laughs> Take it home and wash it and go back to the next time, you know. Wow. Mm. wow. Uh, tell me, do, do you have some films or some projects upcoming? Not that I know of. 
Oh, yeah. I have some theater work, yeah. Tell me I'm about that. To, yeah. Well, I'm going to be doing, I do love letters as a fundraiser for a lot of organizations. It's a mm-hmm. wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, play by A.R. Gurney. Right. And yeah. that's the yeah. two character, and you read it. And uh, you can do it. I've done it with all kinds of men. You'd be surprised all the doctors and lawyers who want to be actors, you know. Mm-hmm. And right. uh, and then I can guide them in it and let them not overact. And it doesn't matter because it's the woman's show anyway. And that is a great up. two character. That is yeah, a great it's two really great. Piece. And I love playing the woman. And she mm-hmm. changes all the time for me. I've been, God, I can't remember how many years now. I bet you I've been doing that about 20 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or maybe I, I, fifteen years, something like that. I bet that. it's wonderful when you when you invest so much time in a particular project and, and you rediscover things. I mean, you have epiphanies oh, all the time. <clears throat> I've always done that. I've never locked anything in. I mean, I say the same words and I do the same moves, you know, and all of that. But I never, never lock in a character. Mm-hmm. I always start from the moment I before I walk on stage, you know. I'm, and then I go from moment to moment. That's the only way to do it. And don't and you know and to just because something gets a, a wonderful reaction, uh, unless you do it spontaneously, the audience won't react. It will just look like somebody's going through it by the numbers. Right. And a lot of actors pride themselves that after opening night they don't change lifting the finger or any sort of little thing. They do the same thing over and over again. Boring, my dear. Boring, boring for yeah. to you as an actor, and boring for the audience. Mm-hmm. True. God, you've got to work from moment to moment. That's that's what Stanislavski's method is all about. That's it's very what it's all about. It's very interesting what <laughs> techniques work for different actors because I've heard that said about De Niro that once he gets it, that's where he is. And then yeah. on the flip side, my favorite actor, who is Mr. Pacino. They, yeah, you know, he he lives for the moment. You right. Found a way to get him right. in. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I've never met De Niro, but I and I like his work when he plays wonderful characters and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you've ever, um, if anybody tries to interview him, he he doesn't connect. He's very ill at ease to mm-hmm. be on mm-hmm. something yeah. to do something uh, in an interview show or something like that. He's quiet. I've seen right. him on a show with a group of people, you know, when he sits, he doesn't say anything. But he's um, he's secure when he's within the character. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. that's the best thing for him to do. And Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, Miss Palmer, we've, Betsy, we've gone on. Betsy, please, for, my God, that, I've revealed my here. whole life for you. <laughs> You've We've got on wrong. for uh, over Have you got enough minutes. stuff? <laughs> We've got plenty, and we really appreciate your time. It's been yes. a really Oh, it was fun. It was it really was... fun with being with both of you, Jamie well, thank and Gary. You likewise. Yeah, I hope it oh. works out well for you. Oh, thank it's going to be great now. Th- okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, you darlings. Night. Okay, Bye-bye. thanks much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.